Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. I should begin by saying, dearly beloved, we are gathered together <laughs> where I won't. Tonight, this motion I am pleased to propose to the House that the church can be relevant and can be renewed. And our motion tonight isn't about faith. It isn't about belief. It's about a church 2,000 plus years old being relevant, reaching out to every single one of you here in this room, giving you a message and giving you a place and a purpose, and also to its ministers, be they priests and members of the laity who are not ordained. This debate challenges all of us to ask a couple of questions. What do we mean by church, and what can church play in a modern Irish society? I welcome this debate, and I want to commend our opponents tonight, who are very fine people, who have very well-meaning views and opinions, which I hope you will not vote for. The church has begun a process of renewal and birth. Cast your minds back to yesterday, 12 months ago. What happened? Will I tell you? I will, because it's relevant. <laughs> Pope Benedict, the former Pope, resigned or announced his resignation. And in that single act of resignation, he set the direction for the church that a new beginning for a church was to commence. That one person, El Papa, the Pope, and his case, Pope Benedict, was not bigger than the papacy, was not bigger than the church. And in that single act of selflessness, he set a new direction for the Roman Catholic Church. And in doing that, he heard at the beginning as the successor to St. Peter, upon which this rock I would build my church, Jesus said. And the rock is all of us in this room. We are the people. The word of God is transmitted to each one of us. But in going back to the act of Pope Benedict, he said that we needed a new leader. And the church, in its conclave, elected Pope Francis, a Jesuit from South America. And what has he done in a 12-month period? And those of you who live in a world of instant social media, who live in the instant Sky News, or who watch Ursula Halligan, who's here on TV3, will tell you it's about instant message, instant communication. And what has he done? He has spread a more palatable message of the church. He's undertaken a structural change. And if I could give you the analogy of a liner in the ocean, He's turning the church around slowly. Can't do it in one go. Takes a couple of turns. And the fundamental reform that he is doing in changing the structures is not sexy. It doesn't make the headlines. It doesn't make the print media. But what it does, for those of us who believe in and who are members of the church, it gives us hope and optimism that this is a man, a leader, can change the locks of the curia in the Vatican and ultimately the hierarchy, the bishops who are appointed to be the, the leaders in the diocese in the local areas. And Pope Francis is politically astute. And he knows that in order to bring lasting, secure church that has meaning and resonance, he must bring that change. So those of you who are living, go ahead. Okay, so regardless of the message that Pope Francis is spreading in the developed world, how can we salvage a church that in countries it can get away with, in countries that it can get away with it, like Nigeria and Uganda, continues to call for like the criminalization of homosexuality and like continues to persecute minorities that like go against it? Very good point. As a gay man, within my church, I feel a second-class citizen up to now. And you may well argue, and you are correct, that the church has been very slow in promulgating a message of change in parts of Africa where to be gay can be a sentence to death, which the church must play a proactive role in changing. But just this Sunday, Archbishop Martin and RT Radio had a message of conciliation, a message of tolerance and respect. And it's that message that Pope Francis gave and the plane coming from World Youth Day in regard to Roosevelt's Brigade that gives us hope. So you may well argue in this room that the church 
an institution run by celibate, predominantly elderly men, does not reflect society, does not have any real understanding of the way people feel or how their lives operate. And you know what? You may be right. But you have to have the hope that the man at the top, Archbishop Martin here in Dublin, can lead that change. It is important, though, to bring a distinction between the hierarchy of the Catholic Church and the clergy, decent men like Father Tony Stanley here, and others, who know the reality of everyday life, who have a voice, who haven't been afraid to use that voice to articulate and promulgate a different type of message, a church that is more tolerant, more respectful, that has an accentuation on the values of what it means to be a Christian. And the Christian understanding is exhibited far better in the parishes and in the, in the, in the communities on the ground than in the Curian rush in Rome or anywhere else. And to me, that is my model of church, a church that is people-centered, where we peel away the, the layers of bureaucracy and where we come down to a humane church that has a central message of Jesus Christ, which is to love one another. The greatest gift I give you is to love. Go ahead. Do you believe people's human ethics will completely disappear, disband once the Catholic Church is there? Do you believe like that's the only thing that drives human beings to be morally right, is the Catholic Church? No. That isn't the motion before us tonight. There is salvation inside the church and outside the church. Um, could it not be argued that arguing that sort of defending a church system that has no biblical basis, very little biblical basis, the, the, the papal dogma, not really in the Bible, the whole idea of the, the, um, the, the traditions of the priesthood, not necessarily in the Bible. It's been argued even that the Apostle Mark priests, like how can you defend a system that has very little literary grounds? We have, thank you, good question. We've had 21 ecumenical councils, going back to the Council of Nicaea, the Vatican II. Each one will be dealing with different areas of dogma, different areas of teaching. What we do need now, though, is a third Vatican Council, in my opinion, dealing with the issue of morality and sexuality. Because the morality and the sexuality of the Church, its teachings and its practices, is from a different era. And I say this, not as somebody who is just here as a gay person, but as a member of society. Because the unions that we all have today are different. Society has a value and the love that we all have for each other in our different types of relationships, in people who get married, whose relationships break up through whatever reason and get remarried, in gay unions, and in friendships, or in our ability to be human <coughs> and to live a life trying to do good. And if I could just say this, the Association of Catholic Priests in Ireland, in a recent survey, in, in, in its terms of the teachings of the family and life of the church, in a survey of 1,500 people, the majority of respondents, 71% between the age of 46 and 75, said the church must change its teaching, must reflect the new Ireland. And more importantly, it said that the sexual unions were not, understand, were not understood by the curia. I come to this debate tonight as somebody who spent five years in the seminary, who left, and what seminaries were priests studying to be priests. <laughs> <laughs> I should have clarified that. <laughs> and in that five years, I formed great friendships. I learned to grow up as a person. But my faith remains strong, despite what our church has done in that period in that awful daft period of our church in the covering up of issues regarding paedophilia and child abuse. And thankfully we now have a structure which I hope will put the people first. I conclude on this. We've seen much reform. We've seen a church immersed in social justice across the world bringing the gospel message but more importantly giving hope to people. In our own country the work of Vincent de Paul the work of people like Sister Stanislaus Kennedy, Father Peter McVerry, <coughs> underlying the importance of, how, of church and of parish and of people. And if I can conclude in this, what we need now is a church that reflects the values that we all have of love, of peace, and of justice. A modern church that listens and evangelizes can do that. It needs your support. The church is not about the Vatican. It's not about the hierarchy, it's about all of, 
of us in this room and Ganoa Dinner, the ordinary person, who are believers. I commend the motion to the House.